appreciated. Alright. Now I'm worried. What's up, Meta Nerds? In this breakdown will cover all 23 variants of the B2 Super Battle Droid, starting off with the Anti Air. From the game Galactic Battlegrounds Clone Campaigns, one of the simplest solutions to having anti air capabilities in an easily deployable form, Bactoid attached a flak packed or heat seeking missile to the arm. In the standard B2 breakdown, we mentioned how the arms were built in a modular way that can come off at the arm or elbow and plug into the power source and droid brain. This so likely required specialized software, which was true for many B1 variants, and we'll see that with a lot of these B2 types. Depending on the intersection of threat level and your resources as a CIS commander, you can easily upgrade this unit to have a missile on both arms, or even three on one side and the standard blaster arm on the right, giving you the ability to fend off infantry as well. This would be incredibly effective against the LAAT gunship, slow moving, packed with clones, and the main workhorse of a ground assault. Giving the CIS this snowballing effect, as the HMP droid gunship was also super effective against ground troops and the LAAT, while it could drop down 12 B2 battle droids, which could then solidify control of the area and prevent any more transports from delivering reinforcements. The B2 assault is seen in Clone Wars Adventures, deployed during the Third Battle of Felucia. There is this gold alloy around its head casing, feet, and around its red eye, which show us these are crucial areas for the B2 systems. The feet are surprising, but the processors are in the head, and many of the fluids used to keep this thing running are packed into this main body area, with the light being a known weak point. We'll see more of this gold alloy in a bit, but this up-armored B2 also packs the standard laser arm and the rocket-firing arm of the B2HA. The B2 Buzzsaw is a six-armed demon, using that modular socket in one of the most interesting ways by having a trio on each side, with two hands for grabbing and one with a buzzsaw blade. This was designed to quickly work its way through difficult terrain, be it dense jungle growth or urban areas with fences, vehicles, or doors. Two hands could pull apart while the saw went to cutting crucial areas like locks, and when the clones tried to stop this thing, it could effortlessly slice through the plastoid armor and soft, fleshy body underneath. In the Colossus of Destiny, we see one trying to take over a public agrocyte mine. Another similar variant seen in that same source and serving a similar role was the Chainsaw Droid, simply having two saw arms and used when non-explosive means were deemed best for capturing entrenched targets. During the Battle of Simulcadia, one cut through the wooden door of the Royal Palace, and then when the guards and Mace Windu tried to stop it, these saws were turned against flesh, only to be sabered in half. The grapple droid was actually used in a similar way to these guys, with the electrically charged industrial pincers being used to chew through the toughest metals, and durable enough to be used like a jackhammer punching through thick stone walls. While being upgraded with more aggressive programming, once it got through an obstacle, it would pounce on any resistance it found. There is heavy modification to the armor and main body with its glowing band across its chest and arms, likely part of the electrical system's overhaul. And since we lose the red eye, the reason we see the glowing light is likely to act in the same role as a visual indicator of its systems. The blue version is the most standard, but the orange one finds a way to pack in fiery plasma ball launchers, and they were used on the invisible hand where they tried to stop the Jedi rescue of the Senate. They learned that the incredible force they generated could be used to create a shockwave of energy across the ground, and leadership realized they work great for regulating the ever-increasing droid independence, often using them as a sort of military police being one of the only units capable of ripping apart defiant battle droids, with one case of a droid deserter during the Battle of Antimont. The body of this super rocket trooper was an upgrade of the B2RP, a much larger rocket system attached to the back and by the knees to allow this unit to fly with the speed and accuracy of a spacecraft, while being transferred over longer distances via the HMP. Once unleashed, they could swarm with different attack vectors, usually letting the buzz droid spread their chaos, while they use their specialized quadruple blaster on each arm to take out the pilots, or board the enemy craft, laser through the hole in this alternate solid beam fire option, and blast their way through everyone inside, being seen both during the Battle of Ringo Vinda and Anaxis. There are no official images of the B-2 air assault, but it seems to be very similar with a long-range and fast-flying jetpack, using some different form of propulsion burning a more volatile fuel, and in the pack itself it had some issues that gave it a high rate of self-destruction, many going off in mid-flight, though some had the unintended effect of causing damage to the enemy by exploding near the enemy ship. The little bit of lore on these from Galaxy at War might give us an answer to the question of if jetpacks can go through shields, as it says they can pass through capital ship shielding and board them like the super rocket trooper. But if you think about that too much, it opens up a whole can of worms on different shields. Intensified deflector shields. And why any ship can enter the shield bubble of another. 
The ACM Trooper is the simplest with just a modular attachment taking the dual wrist blaster to a triple shot. And there's something funny that there's this droid unit also called a trooper. I did a whole video on the B2HA so I won't be too repetitive here, but it does have major modifications to the body, even if at a glance it does look similar. And of course the main feature is that rocket, which does have that heavy, pronounced arc when fired. The RP is an engineering marvel precisely because it looks so plain. The engineers are able to work in a capable jetpack into the same body as the standard model, and I have to wonder if it is burning off Tabana gas to fly, having just one fuel source for the blasters and jets. Some models fly for shorter stints, while those seen during the Sky Battle of Quell could soar for quite a while, and there are around a hundred of these used to take Aeos Sakura's Venator of the Liberty, showing that they were agile enough to harass gunships too. The Snow Droid, or Cold Assault Battle Droid, could almost be considered a different line, but it does use the same droid brain and many internals, while everything else from the color to the shape and size of its body are all changed to make room for new systems, which help keep it operational in the most frigid battlefronts of the galaxy. They lose their iconic wrist blasters in favor of larger hands, which can hold the massive heavy repeating blaster. This points to something finicky in the wrist blaster tech that maybe just couldn't hold up in extreme cold. Their new size looks to be around 3 meters or 10 feet, and when combined with the large snowshoes, it was able to walk across snow but at a very low speed. And when they faced Jedi, all this extra size and heavy weapons didn't really help. But this is definitely one I wish we could have seen a lot more of, both ripping through clones and using that massive blaster against vehicles. Let's pause and thank this video's sponsor, Rocket Money. If you're like me, you've been slowly accumulating different subscription services over the years, and they're kind of starting to build up. And that's where Rocket Money really came in to help me out. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that helps you lower your bills, cancel subscriptions, and just manage your money overall. I'm using Rocket Money to keep an eye on unwanted subscriptions. It's definitely one of those things that can sneak up on you as each of these subscriptions is relatively not that expensive, but they start to snowball. But you can see it all with this simplified layout you can cancel everything from within the app with just a few taps. It's by far my favorite feature as you don't have to go through all these annoying processes, you don't have to do any service calls, it's really simple and all done from within the app. Rocket Money has helped save its customers up to $740 a year with over $500 million in canceled subscriptions. To save more and spend less, join the over 5 million members using Rocket Money today. Go to rocketmoney.com slash metanerds or head down to the link in the description to get started for free. And you can unlock even more features with premium. So be sure to check it out. That's rocketmoney.com slash metanerds to get started for free. The CB3 Cortosis droid was easily one of the most famous because it is simple, unique, and effective. This black colored armor is made of pure Cortosis, an incredibly rare lightsaber resistant material. Other notable changes involve moving the red sensor, now much larger, and move to the crown of the head. And the blasters fire the same, but a very useful feature is that now they are attached via a ball mount so that they can swivel in almost any direction. Its origin comes from the business leadership genius of Watt Tambor, who wanted to have his best team of engineers on the next iteration of the B-Series line, the B-3 unit. The team from Antar-7 would win and go on to cover the B-3, while this unit would be designated as a CB-3, though still considered a B-2 variant which I understand as it's the same height at 1.9 meters, while the B-3 was a towering 4 meters or 13 feet. And what is really important to reiterate, the theory of mind for droids if you will, that what makes a droid a member of a certain series, think of it in a way as a droid species, is that it has the same droid brain matrix. Everything mentioned on this list has B-2 brains, and that pesky emergent phenomena of minds that droids developed over the course of their lives, having a qualia experience of the world that only a fellow B-2 could understand with vastly different internal lives than the minds of vulture droids or droidicas. So really it could just be called the CB2. It's just that it evolved out of the planning for the B3 line. But even with all their firepower and armor, the chosen one was able to find a weak point and slash through a small gap between the two breastplates. But despite that flaw, Darth Sidious ordered a hit on these things because he thought they were too powerful. It would bring about a separatist victory before he could pull off his takeover of the galaxy. So he leaked the intel to the Jedi so that they could eliminate the Techno Union foundries on Metalorn. Though some units did see combat first on Tatooine, and then during the Coruscant Insurrection. Not the Battle of Coruscant at the end of the war, but an event that is explored in the game The New Droid Army. This series of skirmishes coming to be called the Rise of the Cortosis Battle Droid, where novel droid units were used during a brazen attack on the Jedi archives in the temple. D60 comes from the short story Hero of Kartal from the Star Wars Insider issue 68 through 70. It's written by Timothy Zahn, who gave us Thrawn. 
The story revolves around the Separatist plan to test their D-90 experimental variant of the 60 in hopes of destroying the Sparty Creations factory. Factory's most famous creations were the Sparty cloning cylinders, which were the fastest known form of cloning. Kevin Owens could cut the time in half, giving you a 20-year-old adult in just 10 standard years, but this experimental process with a horrifyingly high failure rate could do that in just one year. Fun fact, Thrawn figured out that it was the Force itself striking back to try and prevent these abominations, but he got around this by using the Ysalmiri, a creature that could create a force bubble around itself, evolved as a natural defense against predators that hunted by picking up on a prey's presence in the Force. So by placing the Ysalmiri around these cylinders, the clones were not interfered with. The D60 variant seems to just have this unique look with the visor-like optic sensor, but the D90 was a stronger, if not as agile, commando droid, meant to be something like the OOM but of the B2s. And these units were successful in their attack on Kartal. Now we get to the gold super battle droid, which comes from LEGO Star Wars 3, The Clone Wars, and it is made from that gold armor material we saw with the B2 Assault. By being completely made of this material, it is impervious to blasters, lightsabers, and explosives. Its only weakness is from concentrated rapid fire of heavy blasters. This unnamed alloy was even rarer than Cortosis, and we only have this one instance of this variant. The heavy Super Battle Droid has this unique gray and purple color scheme, with an arm that fired a large plasma bolt that packed so much force there was a notable recoil even on these large heavy units. Fielded early in the Clone Wars during the hunt for the Decimator, and escorting Severance Tan to meet with Borka the Hutt. The Jump Droid fills the gap of the RP and Standard, giving shorter bursts of jetpack power with these simple backpack looking attachments, instead of being integrated into the body. These could be removed, like we see with the commandos of Hope Squad, who quickly found out that they sputtered and ran out of fuel, forcing him to hop from droid to droid until he reached the platform and rescued his targets. The mortar unit would carry into battle a tube and thermal grenades that could be set to explode on a timer or impact, giving it the option to serve an anti-air roll, though most were used to hit targets when you didn't have a line of sight, or to drop them in on the top of fortifications or vehicles, which might have the weakest point on something like a hatch, putting their thickest armor on the front and flanks. Of all these variants, this is one that is simple but serves a real purpose, and it's odd that there are so few mortar units or even vehicle mounted weaponry on either side during the Clone Wars. Another use of that modular arm would give us the Oma Dun, which was able to spray toxic gas. One of the greatest advantages of a droid army is that your troops can harmlessly deploy clouds of compounds that dissolve the flesh of organics. Dirge is the one that unleashes this horror on a Gungan colony, musing that it killed them in seconds. But the Jedi team, including Kenobi, was able to use their powers in the Force to keep back the flesh-eating effects of the swamp gas. Anakin realized that they could still fire bolts as well, producing these enormous beams like the Heavy Super, and using his Force abilities to turn them towards each other just as they fired, it resulted in their brilliant transformation into slag. A hilarious matchup is the Ori Trooper, with a specialized layer of extra armor around the neck and arms, and the arm is swapped with a flamethrower. The Aurea was native to Geonosis, like the droids themselves, and their Geonosian creators had used them as mounts for all their recorded history. This inversion of the galactic norm, of an organic sitting on top a mechanized mount like a speeder or walker, must have been a strange sight for the enemy or local population. And it's unclear why this choice was made, it had to be a logistics nightmare, trying to keep Ore pens on lucre hulks and then get them into C9979s, but it was likely for the same reasons people today use donkeys or horses in very difficult terrain where a thinking, organic being that evolved to navigate harsh terrain is superior and requires less maintenance. The Repeater Super used its powerful servos and motivators to haul a heavy repeating blaster like an E-Web, something that took a crew of imps to carry, assemble, and operate, and then use its simple grip hands to operate. Another really cool example that takes advantage of a droid unit, and no muscle fatigue to worry about, it really opens up creative options like this, and did have specialized added targeting software. The beta versions were smaller and weaker, despite their apparent six-pack area, instead of the standard accordion section. They quickly were seen as a failure and abandoned, having been inept in every early combat scenario, to the point that they were almost never seen just months into the war. While the Mark II and III were the final iterations fielded toward the very end of the war, and they were an exciting new up-armored version that filled its creators with hopes that it could deliver a CIS victory. They weren't in on the fact that the game was rigged, so you could see why they were excited with these larger droid brain areas, bulkier arms, and lighter legs, which all gave it a supposedly better mix of speed, agility, processing power, and accuracy, while being able to absorb more shots before failure, with much thicker plating in these crucial areas like the head and chest. 
But that does bring us to the end of the list for all the B2 variants. If you think I missed any, please comment them down below. You might be thinking of some like the B3, which I plan to make a video on soon. Please hit that like button, it's the best way to help me out. Subscribe to see more and check out these videos, I'm sure you'll like them. But most important of all, remember, the war crime options are endless when your own troops are immune to the worst weapons out there. And the force will be with you. Always.